Hi, everybody. Welcome <laughs> to Read Science. I'm Joanne Manister. Science got us on all the social medias. I guess people are going everywhere now, not just Twitter slash X, right? So, but uh, you can find me all those places where I love to talk about popular science books and promote our program. I'm joined by my co-host, Jeff Schomeyer. We've been doing this for 10, 11 years. So yeah, it's great. We've talked to so many great people and now we get to add author Ben <laughs> Goldfarb to our list. And Ben has the great, uh, I guess, honor of being the author of my favorite book of 2023. And yeah. that book is Crossings, How Road Ecology is Shaping the Future of Our Planet. And I have to say, <laughs> this 2023 was an excellent book for popular mm -hmm. science books. I read so many good ones. So really, you're the top of the top. It's great. Now I'm you so honored. Thanks, Joanne. <laughs> yeah, it, I learned so much. So how do you get to be a top book in my mind? Learn a lot. Mm -hmm. It's very clear. I'm super impressed by how many people you talk to, and I'm sure we'll get a question about mm -hmm. that. But uh, you also wrote a book prior to this that I also really liked and didn't get you on at that time, but let's put that sort of here. That's mm -hmm. eager, and I can't read the subtitle eager. through tiny, tiny yeah. things. Very, blah, very blah, 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 beavers, blah, 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 matter. You, you yes, got right. it. Exactly. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that book won a Penn Literary Award, right? So yeah, next. named named in honor of your, your friend, uh, Ed Wilson. Ed <laughs> Wilson, who's been a, a lovely guest. I don't know what year that was, but we, we Way had to back. find someone in Boston, someone I knew, to go to him at his uh, residence to set, you know, because we thought there's no way he's going to set this all up, Google Hangouts or whatever we were using back then. So it was 2013, our first 2000, year. Was it? Yeah. Oh, wow. We, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Um, so, Ben, uh, let me go ahead and read your bio and. Uh, we're super glad you're here. So uh, Ben Goldfarb is an environmental journalist whose work has appeared in National Geographic, The Atlantic, Smithsonian Magazine, and many other publications. As all our guests, you're in all the places we would expect a great writer of science material to be. Um, he is the author of Crossings, How Road Ecology is Shaping the Future of Our Planet, named one of the best books of 2023 by the New York Times and Joanne Manister, um, and, uh, <laughs> and Eager, The Surprising Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter, winner of the Penn E.O. Wilson Literary Science Writing Award. He lives in Colorado with his wife, Elise, and his dog, Kit, which is, of course, what you call a baby beaver. And uh, <laughs> we are so glad you're here. And, you know, the first thing I thought when I saw this book, first thing I thought were land bridges. That's the first thing I thought. Mm -hmm. But yeah. you go into so many other mm -hmm. things like habitat fragmentation, which as don't, a biologist, I totally don't understand. Give it all away. I won't. <laughs> but, so, I mean, roadkill, runoff, and some of this stuff will segue into what my daughter does for her PhD uh, and yeah. noise and everything roads have to offer us. <laughs> Mostly <laughs> negative, but <laughs> right. anyway yes yeah um, yeah that was that was certainly the goal was to was to was to be as kind of broad and uh far-reaching as possible mm -hmm. just like our just like our road network right mm -hmm. that's right that's very good yeah like yeah that's very comprehensive but jeff i'll leave the first question to you <laughs> that, if i that, haven't covered it all <laughs> well we're, we're pretty much there now there's my first question is in two parts although i think of them sort of as the same idea because there were when I read the book, there were two things that sort of astounded me. Mm. It's like, oh, I didn't expect this. And the first is that you look at it, it says it's going to be about roads, and it's about roads. Like, <laughs> we have to convince people that, no, really, it's interesting. And actually, it's about road ecology. Mm. And uh, maybe that'll that'll come as we go. But it's like, but it really is about roads and road ecology and all of those things. and a big theme is how roads divide habitats for all animals on earth. And when you sort of halfway through, after you talked about various groups of animals and things, one thing that, that really astounded me is 
I wrote down a question that says, you know, if we sat down and said, let's talk about what roads do to wildlife habitat and migration, mm -hmm. we could probably think of things about how it's difficult for deer to do their things and how there may be some uh, breeding disruption and stuff like that. What astounded me is the magnitude, the scale that things are disrupted. And I thought maybe we could start there to let people know we're talking about some big issues. There is a whole book's worth to talk about and it barely covers everything. And it's the magnitude that makes it such a vitally important problem to, to learn about and to solve. Yeah, well, I, th I think you're exactly right, Jeff. And that, you know, that was one of the things that kind of astonished me too mm -hmm. right, when I first uh, began kind of evaluating the book potential of the topic. <laughs> I was like, well, mm -hmm. this this, this seems interesting to me, but you know, is is this? I mean, how big is the the impact of roads really? You know, and, yeah. and then, you, then you kind of read some of the literature, and and it's just astonishing. You know, I mean, there are four million miles of roads in the U.S. alone, forty million miles uh, around the world. You know, where we kill more than a, a million animals, vertebrate animals, to say nothing of the all of the insects uh, with our cars every single day. Every uh, day. <laughs> every day. It's, it's, kind of, it's, it's sort of unfathomable. Um, you know, we, I mean, it's, it's, it's impossible to get, uh, you know, farther than 20 miles from a road uh, anywhere in the, in the lower 48. Uh, you know, so these are, these are structures that are just, they're just part of our everyday lives uh, in, in this really inescapable way. And I think that was one of the things that interested me about the topic as well was, you know, the, the, their magnitude is such that they're almost, they're almost invisible to us, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're everywhere. We've, we've kind of stopped seeing them, I, I think. And that was one of the, the intents of the book was to, you know, to make us pay new attention to these structures that uh, we, we really uh, can't get away from and, and thus have kind of blinded ourselves to. Right. And, um, so the the organization was very interesting too of of looking at uh, different groups of animals, the deer, the bugs, the frogs, um, the amphibians, the people, and seeing how each group has been disrupted and uh, and what and the fact that you worked all the way to people and even looked at the disruption in communities and discuss some really important issues that are hot topics today there. Tell us what road ecology is so that we have some, some framework for discussing all these things and what, what it encompasses. Is that what got you there? Or did you get there by saying roads could be interesting? And then you learned about road yeah, ecologists. That's, that's, that's <laughs> easy, easy question. question, whichever one no. it was. Yeah, I, it's, I'm it's imagining a, why you're writing eager, you go, roads they're every wow look at I, that's my thinking is what happened but you know that's my origin story for you right that, 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 that i mean there, i mean certainly there's a, there's a lot of overlap between those you know those those two topics mm -hmm. you know to, to me I mean, I mean really in some ways I, th I think that my interest in the in road ecology predated my interest in beavers in a lot mm -hmm. of ways oh, okay. it really goes back to i mean to 2013 you know when you guys were starting the show uh i i was i was you know i'm a journalist and i was i was reporting an article about habitat fragmentation and kind of ah. in, uh -huh. in montana and i had the chance to go up on this wildlife overpass on highway 93 yes, yes. and I, I think i mentioned this in the book oh yeah and it was just you know it was just this kind of like magical fascinating moment for a couple of reasons i mean first was just the the kind of the the beauty and inspiration of it, right? You know, we do so much on this planet to make animals' lives harder and more dangerous. Uh, you know, often with our infrastructure. And here was this, you know, multi-million dollar structure that we'd we'd uh, you know built to make their lives easier and and safer. And I, you know, I found that again really really inspiring. But then I was also kind of like fascinated by the intellectual challenge of it, mm -hmm. right? How do you create a built piece of infrastructure that's enticing to a grizzly bear or a bobcat or an elk, you know, the whole suite of animals that, you know, has to get across. Turtles, the hedgehogs. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, all of those animals, of course, they occupy different niches. They have different habitat requirements and they have different, you know, wildlife crossing requirements as well. And they all experience yeah. the road in a different way. Yeah. Uh, so, and so that, you know, that also, that, that felt kind of bookish to me, you know, the, the idea that to, to fully understand and mitigate the impacts of our roads. You know, we have to think like wild animals. And that's that's in some mm -hmm. ways what road ecologists attempt to do is, you know, put themselves in the paws and hooves and wings of all of these other these other critters. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that just seemed 
so interesting to me. So it was really that experience in 2013, hanging out with roadie ecologists and checking out these wildlife crossings in Montana. That was what got me uh, so so fired up about this topic. So you, you thought it was worth doing and, and the book reads as though, and then so you started and then you found out it was really worth doing and that it just kept, there's more. There it seemed like there was always more uh, things that you could look at. It's like astounding after astounding. Um, right. Yeah, so you know, I'm imagining it was a process for you, but it was. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I mean, Jeff, you know, you mentioned all of those different organisms or groups mm -hmm. of organisms, right? The right, the you know, the deer and the turtles and the fish, you know, and the the monarch butterflies, you know. And I think that's the kind of the fascinating thing about road ecology is that you know, in some ways, all of those different animals experience roads in different ways, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've got. You know, you've got the right, the you know, the frogs and the salamanders, you know, who are who are trying to migrate to their breeding ponds, uh, you know, on those warm, wet spring <laughs> nights. They're you know, they're being hit in enormous numbers, and and you know, and and are sort of subject to these massive squishings. And then you've got animals like you know, mountain lions and grizzly bears that actually avoid roads and won't mm -hmm. you know, won't cross them at all. And you know, and for those larger carnivores, you know, the problem is really genetic fragmentation, the fact that these animals can't negotiate their habitats to find each other, to, to mate. You know, you've got butterflies and, you know, and, and uh, some scavengers mm -hmm. that actually use the roads as habitat, right? They're migrating mm -hmm. along, uh, you know, these roadside strips of vegetation um, that uh, are available to them. So, you know, it's, I think that's the kind of the, the beauty of the topic in some ways, is mm -hmm. just its complexity and it's the kind of the multidimensional nature of it. Yeah. where every single group of organisms is encountering roads in a different way and, and being impacted negatively or in some yeah. cases positively by them. One, one yeah. more short one, Joanne, because just because everybody's <laughs> already mentioned uh, the animal overpass, which is yeah. sort of visible and things and probably real controversial thing, but also in line with the magnitude question, I don't know if it was the same one in Montana that you were talking about, but one of the overpasses you mentioned that was uh, like... Uh, had dirt and shrubs and things, and is bigger than uh, in scope than people imagine. I think. Yeah. You talked about um, there was like a year long census of video and things that watched, and the amazing number of different species and then different individuals that made use of that was also as an astounding. It may, makes me smile, but I can't remember the number right now. But whatever it was, I think it was ten times bigger than what I expected, or a hundred times bigger. That done right this these these things do an amazing amount of usefulness to mitigate the the crap that we've done with our roads um i'm sorry i don't think that was really a question but no, uh, i can't remember what that number was but it was something like no during the year a hundred thousand different you know individuals use this some of them had started living on it uh, yeah. smaller ones and things yeah like you know, no, you're absolutely right, Jeff. And I think that's a, yeah, it's, a, it's an astute observation is that, look, we, you know, I, I mean, all people always ask me, you know, it's like, do those, do those things really work? You know, is I it worth bothering? Things, right. Is it, is it, you know, is it, is it worth building these, these crossings? You know, it's an, it's a nice idea, but come on, you know, animals <laughs> use them. and the answer is, yeah, animals use them very, very readily, you know, mm -hmm. very quickly in, in many, in many cases in, you know, as you said, Jeff, enormous numbers, you know, there are individual yeah. passengers out there that have crossed, that have you know, allowed literally hundreds of thousands of animals uh, to, to cross over or, so. or, or through them. Um, they they and, use them quickly and enormously if they're done right, but we'll get to culverts later, I expect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I do want to talk about culverts. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I saw, I, Bet it was one of your tweets or whatever they're called now. <laughs> um, yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the oh my gosh, some govern big governmental agency has now said you can sign up now to get some of this grant money to build these wildlife passes to prevent the wildlife vehicular accident WVA, right? I, right. I'm sure you shared that. So that was like just as recently as December. So after your book came out. So yeah. not that your book did this, but right. it's that, yeah, really that, nice that, that people that are been, thinking of it. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And that, yeah, that, and that had definitely been in the, in the works uh, for, for years. And so, you know, I can take no credit, but um, <laughs> oh, it, you know, it, it is really exciting. As you said, you know, there's this in the, in the, the 2021 infrastructure act, you know, there was this $350 million pot of grant grant funding mm -hmm. that you're referring to jo uh, Joanne um, that, you know, that basically, right. As you say, we'll, we'll sort of fund, these projects, uh, you know, these wildlife crossing projects uh, around around the country, and you know, and that money has started to 
kind of go out the door. You know, we got, uh, I want to say $18 million for a wildlife overpass on I-25 here in, in, uh, in Colorado. Um, or maybe that was 20 million. Um, you know, Montana, Utah, uh, you know, a bunch of different states have gotten, uh, you know, really big chunks of, uh, of, of funding now. Um, so it's, it's an, you know, it's an incredibly exciting time to be, to be doing this work and, and engaged in this, this field. And, you know, I think that one really important point about these passages, um, you know, and I think that one of the reasons they're, they're so hot right now in a lot of ways is that, yes, they're great for wildlife. You know, we know that animals use them, of course, but they're also really good for driver safety, right? Oh, yes. that, you know, that, that you build these things and, you know, if you can prevent, you know, several dozen deer or elk or moose collisions in a year, you know, you're saving drivers' lives and you're saving lots of money too. You know, that the wildlife vehicle collisions are these incredibly expensive accidents, right? Or crashes. You know, there's the 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 insurance costs and the hospital bills and the vehicle repairs and the tow trucks and so on and on. So, you know, sometimes people kind of look at the price tag of these wildlife crossings and say, wait a second, are we, you know, we're really going to spend, you know, $10 million helping deer and bears cross a highway. That seems kind of frivolous, but you know, these mm -hmm. structures pay for themselves really quickly in, in many cases by preventing all of these, these dangerous crashes. So they really are, you know, win, 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 wins uh, in a lot of respects. <laughs> so I have to say, I haven't had a deer collisions possible. We see the signs all the time. I haven't had that. I think I hit a squirrel once and was ruined for the rest of the day. Yeah, but so when, <laughs> when I was a girl uh, in Guam, and so I lived there, my dad was Air Force, so we lived there middle school and high school. So I learned to drive on Guam. And there were certain roads, I believe, I forget what time of year it was, but frogs came out and they mm. were all over the roads and you could not drive without running over some of them. And you go home and you rinse off your tires because, you know, you do the best you can. But, you know, we're just talking swarms like those crabs across the road in Australia. Yeah. So things like that. So um, why I get it. Frogs and toads. It was toads. But uh, toads are cold blooded. Are roams warm or they're just trying to get to the other side? Or what is it about amphibians and roads that they don't go, oh, my, that big predator might get me, yeah. <laughs> or, you know, they don't think of that. They're just going along their merry way. That was my sense from your chapter on amphibians. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think, I mean, I mean, really it's that they're, you know, they're, they're mating, right. They're, you know, they're, they're kind of, they're heading for <laughs> their, their breeding ponds and they're, you know, they're thinking about nothing else, right. Besides, uh, you know, getting to that, that pond and, uh, and, you know, doing, doing their thing. There's a, I think a, there's a great um, George Orwell essay of all people where it wrote a, a wonderful essay about toad mating season, you know, and he describes them entering uh, a phase of intense sexiness, uh, which is kind of a funny, a funny way to describe funny it. Funny way to describe it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, you know, but they're but there's I mean I think they just you know they're I mean this is true frogs, toads, salamanders you know they're just so single-mindedly focused um, on, uh, on on reproduction um, that uh, you know they kind of ignore the road that uh, you know that goes through their midst and I think that's you know one of the kind of the essential challenges with amphibians especially is that you know so where do we where do we build our roads you know we build our roads in kind of low-lying areas right where it's easy to construct them and those low-lying areas are also where water collects and mm -hmm. where you know ephemeral pools and ponds form in the spring and and uh you know where our streams are and that's and that's where those amphibians are headed right is for those you know toward, toward those those little freshwater ecosystems uh that often are, are adjacent to roads un unfortunately so there's this mm -hmm. fundamental conflict i think between amphibian reproduction and uh, road construction well i had i had a little mathematical moment in my brain while I was I think reading about that was like well yes there are these lakes and they're potted, spotted around and where do we build our cities not in the lakes yeah. so we put a city over here and we have one over here not in the lakes well where do we put our roads we want to get from one city to the other they always go in between the lakes because that's, that's where we don't build the cheaper cities. to build yeah it's cheaper to uh, build so a flat road than a bridge yeah, right, but it's, right. and it's just going to happen that way. But since you're talking about the amphibians, then what's the answer for amphibians? Like, you know, do amphibians or do toads a little bit bigger? And so we can understand some of the issues and maybe, and what was a relatively simple, straightforward solution if done right? 
Yeah. Well, you know, there are lots of wildlife crossings for amphibians out there. You know, there are there are toad. I mean, these these toad tunnels that I read about in the book. You know, those those started getting built in in Europe in the 1960s and 70s. And you know, the, the U.S. I think we're we're kind of behind on the the amphibian tunnel game a, a little bit. We haven't built nearly as many as uh, as as European countries, probably because we're so focused on you know, the big animals like the deer mm-hmm. and the elk that will actually kill you if you hit them. You know, mm-hmm. we're, we're very driver safety <laughs> oriented, which is uh, understandable, but it means that a lot of the smaller critters, we don't we don't really think about it, unfortunately. But, you know, a, a well-built little toad passage with, you know, some tiny fences on either side of it to kind of funnel the, the toads there works works really well. And that's, you know, kind of the, the beauty of um, these amphibian migrations that, that you know, they're, they're moving across the same places every single year, right? They're migrating to those same breeding ponds year after mm-hmm. year after year. So, you know, you've, you've a pretty good idea of where those, you know, those, those kind of massive squishing hotspots are. And, and uh, they're, you know, they're, they're fairly easy to mitigate, uh, you know, if you, if you take the trouble. Can you describe, I was just looking at my notes, but can you describe edge habitats? A new yeah. idea to me, and I was amazed to find out the number of animals who live there, who thrive there, what they are, and how it's a big ecosystem. It's just like, it's a new way of looking at, at what's beside the roads. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so those those, those edge habitats, you know, those are those are kind of the, the ecotones, you know, the area where, you know, a forest or another kind of habitat bumps into, uh, you know, a kind of a human clearing, essentially. And often that, you know, that clearing is is the road. And, you know, it's 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 fascinating because, you know, those those edge habitats, they, you know, they can be really biodiverse in a lot of ways. Right. A lot mm-hmm. of you know, generalist species are, are happy there. You know, uh, it, it, I mean, you drive around the suburbs and you see, you know, a million white tailed deer kind of mm-hmm. browsing those edge habitats, which, you know, combines there's there's the forest right there. So there's some yep. good for them. And but there's also the field, which has the that's why we have so many in our yard is because <laughs> our yard is an edge. Really, <laughs> once you describe it. Uh, yeah, it's exa- exactly. So, you know, there are lots of species that do well along along those edges, but then there are also species that, you know, that that uh, that hate those edges, right? And that, you know, that won't mm-hmm. that want to be, you know, in the in the dense forest and won't necessarily um, you know, cross the, uh, you know, cross the 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 road or the clearing. Um, and you know, I, I, in the book I I read a bit about the the edge habitats in the context of of uh, of the Amazon. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, where there have been something like a hundred thousand miles of illegal logging roads, mm-hmm. you know, all over the Amazon, and all of those roads have created edges, right? These clearings through the forest, and you know what often happens is that all of that wind and light that you know exposes trees that are more accustomed to living in you know the, the deep rainforest, uh, and so the trees die and they you know they drop all of their leaves and branches, and then that becomes fuel for wild for wildfires, which, you know, burns the forest and creates more edges. So, you know, so edges are kind of, they're sort of this self-reinforcing cycle. You know, once you penetrate the forest, edges just perpetuate themselves and, and create more and more of this edge habitat that's, you know, good for some species, but bad for uh, for lots more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That yeah. can be was... good for monarch butterflies sometimes. Maybe, maybe yeah. not, right? <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. the idea that there are smaller animals that live entirely along the edge mm-hmm. of roads, this is their their life. Yes, yeah. yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, for some, uh, I mean, certainly like there, you know, there are rodents that, uh, you know, are very happy living along, uh, you mm-hmm. know, those highway medians or, or edges, you know, those, those pollinating insects that you mentioned, you know, certainly there are, you know, some bees and butterflies that will probably spend their whole lives, uh, you know, along along the side of the road. And, you know, I mean, especially in, in places like like the Midwest, you know, where so much of the landscape is corn and soy monoculture, you know, mm-hmm. there's, <laughs> in the middle of Illinois is where exactly, I'm at. So, right. yeah. you know, so those, those roadsides are some of the only public land out there that's not, you know, intensively cultivated and, and, and they are potentially good habitat. The problem, obviously, is that you know, the road is a dangerous place to be, right? And, and uh, you know, so, you know, I, th- I think there's a, a, you know, I think that probably, you know, the, the benefits of that roadside habitat outweigh the the detriment. But, you know, I do think mm-hmm. we have to, you know, think hard mm-hmm. about whether, in what situations are we creating ecological traps, you know, luring animals to the roadside with mm-hmm. the promise of habitat and then, you know, killing them with our, our cars, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. So I, I had read Jennifer Ackerman's book, What the Owl Knows. Oh, yeah. And uh, so that came out this year, also very good. Yeah, yeah. And I never thought of this, but they said, you know, when you throw an apple out your window, apple core out your window as you're driving along, thinking, okay, I'm not polluting because something it's going to decompose, <laughs> something's going to eat it. But 
she says this this actually rodents that live along the edge will be happy to eat that but an owl might go swoop down but then right. hit by a car i was like okay you know i i never had thought of that and but it made me more conscious and then when i read your book about these edge habitats mm -hmm. i was like okay yeah i see it i see it for sure so it's yeah, very, it's very I interesting. Remember, it is. Yeah. I, remember, I remember reading a similar dynamic about it. There's a highway, I think it's a stretch of I-84 in Idaho that, that gets lots of lots of grain trucks in this big wheat production mm. area. Mm, sure. there, are green, there are grain trucks that spill the grain, attract the rodents, and then that becomes this owl slaughterhouse, essentially. And yeah. that involves, those poor owls, right? They're you know they're swooping so low uh, to catch rodents, and they're just you know right they're going right through the path of uh, vehicles. It's uh, you know it's terrible. I, you know I think that I mean to me that that just speaks to this bigger issue, which is that you know we just we just you know we're, we're I think that we're blind to so much of the roadkill that's happening mm -hmm. there, right? We see the larger animals, you know, we see the yeah. deer and some of the raccoons and possums, you know, but we don't see the birds, the rodents, the, the toads, you know, we're, we're driving along at 70 miles an hour sealed in our little metal and glass bubbles. Uh, and so we just don't see the smaller stuff, you know, and, and, uh, and we don't recognize, especially the birds, you know, what a huge toll cars take on them. Mm -hmm. Close to 300 million birds uh, killed in the U.S. every every year by cars. You know, it's it's really just catastrophic. So, you know, it's, I mean, I, I, one of the things that I, I did in working on the book was take part in this kind of citizen science roadkill bike ride where we, we biked mm -hmm. along a highway uh and i was astonished by how many songbirds especially you you see when you're closer to the ground and moving much more slowly than you would in a car so it's a it's a gigantic problem so you're not on an interstate i assume it just sounds like like you could be roadkill if you were on a, biking on an interstate, but maybe one of the country roads or you know it wasn't it wasn't an interstate, but it was it was it was Highway ninety three. It was you know it was a big okay. U.S. federal highway. Um, so it was it was uh, yeah it was it was pretty busy and it was pretty scary. You know you sort of like I think you I, that experience <laughs> maybe empathize with wild animals in a new way. You know being uh, being out of your car, being this soft, exposed, vulnerable body in in this mm -hmm. world of automobiles. It was a, a really intense and, and kind of frightening experience so i, I want to add something so as i um i first listened to the book and then i read it and my first listen i thought he has talked to so many people you know mm -hmm. that you mentioned in the book and then i thought surely there's that many more that didn't make it into the book so right. then in when i read the physical book to prepare for today i saw in your acknowledgments you talked to easily 250 people 250 people is what you said that and i thought that is incredible and how do you go about finding these people <laughs> do you do you go yeah you just talk to one person they said you might want to talk to that person or do you say how is roadkill in australia let me dig that up like <laughs> what, what's that process of finding that many people to talk to so you have a really well-informed book yeah well, thanks. You know, yeah, it's, it's, I would say it's a, it's a combination of, of strategies. I mean, certainly like, there's a, you know, you, the first thing you do when you embark on a new book project, at least the first thing that I've done with my two books is, you know, is you go on Google Scholar, you know, and figure yeah. out who mm -hmm. is who's publishing on this, on, you know, in, in this field. And, you know, a bunch of names uh, immediately pop up, you know, Tony Clevenger, Patty Kramer, you know, Marcel Hauser, the people who, you know, rhodecologists have certainly heard of. Um, it's like, okay, here, here, obviously the leaders of the field or in the field, um, you know, certainly uh, a lot of it is, um, you know, a lot of it is that sort of snowball inter inter interview technique that you described, Joanne, where, you know, at the end of the conversation, you say, okay, who are three other people I should be talking to? Uh, and you, you know, you find folks that way. Um, you know, conferences were, were helpful to me, the, mm -hmm. you know, the international uh, conference on the ecology of transportation. Um, you know, it was a, a really, a really fun and, and uh, productive one. Um, and then social media, you know, I, I, I uh, you know, I, I often use the hashtag road ecology, um, which uh -huh. is a really popular, uh, or at least somewhat popular hashtag on uh, on on the platform formerly known as Twitter, you know, and you find a lot of people <laughs> that way, and and uh, you know, and, and then people kind of like hear through the grapevine that you're working on a book about road ecology, and they contact you and say, hey, you know, let me tell you about my my research, and so you know, I think that look, obviously, all science journalists are uh, incredibly dependent on on the mm -hmm. generosity and knowledge and access of, of their their sources, and you know, I'm I'm no different. I mean, I, I just feel right. uh, so fortunate to have met so many 
great people and you know in both of my sort of intellectual communities both the beaver community and the uh, the Rodeo <laughs> community it's, uh, so it's one of the great gifts of working on uh, working on books is becoming mm -hmm. part of this uh, part of the community this is a random question just because i'm in academia yeah do any universities have a road ecology program or are they just always sort of a sub sub program mm. in some you know, environmental studies department. I yeah, I don't know if you would know that, but I mean, there are people who are road ecologists. That is their what they call themselves. Yeah, you know? that, that's a, that's a, such a good question, Joanna. Is there is there a road ecology department? I mean, I guess I would say that. So there, you know, there there are there's you know there's the Western Transportation in Institute, which is affiliated with the University of Montana. Um, mm -hmm. They certainly have uh, grad students, and those those folks uh, do some do some teaching. I'm not sure you call it a true department. Uh, yeah, you know, I think, I mean, I think that generally it, it is kind of housed under, you know, under, under wildlife biology departments or, you know, or, or engineering departments. Um, you know, it's there, there's, you know, there's no road ecology major out there as far mm -hmm. as I, as far as I, I know. Um, no, de no degrees in road no, ecology. No no, not, not yet. Not yet. Yeah. But you know, maybe yet. it's maybe it's coming. And I, I mean, I mean, definitely in the last several years, you know, I, I've de I definitely hear a lot more sort of dedicated road ecology classes, even if there's no there's no major yet. Um, you know, I know that Cornell has a, a, a road ecology class this this semester, so it's you know it's starting to penetrate the halls of academia to some extent. Mm -hmm. So we at, you know, we've been talking a lot about the West part of yeah. the United States. And of course, you visited Australia, and your book does mention things in the East, including including your chapter reparations, which is about human humans yeah. and their relationship with the road and things like that. But yeah, um, are there lots of projects on the East side? You know, east of the hundredth meridian, or or is almost everything on the West? Yeah, you know, it's it's definitely it's it's historically been a, a much more Western. Um, discipline. I would say that you know, like the the reason for that is, is interesting. You know, so in, in the West, right? It's you know, it's it's it's, it's much. It's you know, conditions are much drier. Uh, you know, more extreme. You know, colder. Um, and so animals tend to be migratory, right? Because resources mm. are scarce. So animals have to move long distances, you know, finding winter habitat when it's, you know, really cold and snowy and finding water when it's, you know, hot, hot and dry. Uh, and so, you know, you get these big migratory herds of deer and elk and antelope and other, other species. Um, and, you know, when you, when you have a thousand deer all crossing a highway in the same place year after year, and you know, 50 of them are getting hit by cars. There's this really big pile of carcasses saying, you know, hey, put a wildlife crossing right here, right? Mm -hmm. um, whereas in the east, you know, it just feels like white-tailed deer are kind of all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, they're they're everywhere. Don't, not migratory. They're everywhere. They're you know, and they're not. They're not. In many cases, they're not getting hit in discrete hot spots, right? So I think mm -hmm. that historically, mm -hmm. a lot of transportation departments have kind of thrown their hands up and said, "Well, like, what what can we do about this? You know, we can't build wildlife crossings everywhere, so let's just not bother." Um, so that's why the Western states, you know, I think have historically been ahead of the curve, um, but that's starting to change. You know, there's there's you know, there's more recent research showing that uh, you know you really can mitigate white-tailed deer collisions. You know, they do move along. Uh, you know, sort of pred predictable pathways mm -hmm. like those, you know, those forest edges that Jeff mentioned or yeah. street corridors, you know, so we can fence those areas and build crossings there uh, and deal with this problem. So, you know, so in this latest round of federal funding that we were talking about earlier, you know, there are states like Missouri and Pennsylvania and Connecticut that got grants to, to do research basically to figure out, okay, you know, we don't know, we, you know, like, I mean, the Western states have lots of data about where they're vehicle collision mm -hmm. hotspots are. The Eastern states haven't generally collected as much of that data, but they're starting to do that. Um, and they got, you know, a bunch of these states got, got grants to do more of that work to figure out, you know, okay, what can we do about this problem moving forward? But you're, you're right that it has been traditionally, a, you know, a much more Western uh, discipline than an Eastern one. We're talking about roadkill, and, and there's a, a tie-in out there too. Uh, just to note that there were, for me, a number of memorable sentences in your writing too, which I think oh, is thanks. a splendid thing as well. And uh, I think for my, I think my favorite one from from uh, your book is going to be um, this: that American roadkill cuisine has a long and storied history. 
<laughs> which, which I was quite entertained by. But <clears throat> the story you told about, uh, I'd have to look at my notes and I don't, I don't want to take the time, about the group <clears throat> in Alaska that mm. collected roadkill elk? Yeah. Or moose? Moose. One moose. Of, yeah. moose. Uh, and over a 10-year period, and would would butcher them, I guess, and then distribute them to to hungry people, people who could use them, make good use of them. That uh, over ten years, they did something like forty thousand. I think probably four thousand. Four thousand, maybe, yeah. but a very large number. <laughs> like, of, still, that's still a lot of moose meat going out there. Yeah. That's Thanks a lot of moose, and yeah. that kept kept a lot of people alive through the winters. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. It's interesting, but. <laughs> yeah. Also, a sense of magnitude and all these things. Since since Joanne brought it up, and uh, I, I sure want to mention it if it seems we're talking about. It's like fairly recently, the American zeitgeist has picked up on redlining, and mm. people now know what it means. And it came up, but sort of over here in what you were talking about when you got to human community ecology and roads and the development of the interstate system. And I would like you just to do some of that story because it's really important and maybe yes. strikes people I, as relevant and also <sighs> sad and horrifying. I, you know, it's one of those things that, that, that makes slightly sympathetic white people like me go, what, what was the story? Yeah. How could, you know, how could all this happen? I appreciate you adding that chapter. So yeah. I, I just did not expect it, you know, yeah. and of course we're animals too, humans. Well, it's like certainly me. far, far from gratuitous. It fits <laughs> it fit it in right it there. It fits perfectly. Yeah. Beautifully. Well, well, thanks. Thanks for saying that. I'm so, I'm so glad that that chapter worked yeah. for you guys, because that was, that was, you know, one of the chapters I was most nervous about, you know, my mm -hmm. background is really ecology and environmental science, you know, and, and I definitely felt like, you know, I mean, there's just been so, so there's been so much written about about redlining and the impacts of uh, of, of urban freeways that uh, you know I was I was sort of uh, a little bit worried to dip a toe into that that yeah. literature um, because it's a little a little less familiar to me. But you know, I, I think you're, I think you're right that that's it's you know vital to include that because as you you know as you say, Joanne, you know we are we are all animals, right? And and you know roads affect us and wild animals in very analogous ways. You know, we get hit by cars just like deer and elk do. You know, we, uh, road noise, the same road noise pollution that's, you know, chasing birds away from their habitat is literally taking years off of our lives. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the same freeways that are dividing ecosystems are also, you know, dividing communities, right? So we're all kind of in it together. But, you know, I also think it's really important to acknowledge that not all humans are affected by roads equally, right? Mm -hmm. And you, know, you go back to the middle of the 20th century and, you know, these very callous, racist, white planners built urban freeways through, you know, name an American city, Minneapolis, Miami, mm -hmm. Syracuse, L.A., uh, you know, Memphis. I'm from uh, Kansas City, and I remember <laughs> some of the divided, predominantly black communities when highway things were being built. Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, it's 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 hard to name a place where this this didn't happen to some extent, yeah. where you know planners didn't say, hey, there's you know there's a black community we view it as undesirable, uh, you know, we're just gonna you know drive a new freeway through there and, and urban renewal was big yeah, at the urban time. Renewal, exactly. Yeah, yeah, you want, you want to get rid of those ugly places with low property values. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, so, so, you know, I think that's a really, a really important story to tell. I think, you know, you kind of can't tell the story of, of, uh, of highway construction in America with, without it. And I think that, you know, one of the inspiring things about it is that we're starting to deal with that, that mm -hmm. problem, you know, that, uh, that cities like Milwaukee and Rochester have, you know, removed some of those yeah. Uh, historically racist freeways, and you know the place that I, I wrote about in that chapter was, was Syracuse, New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in the 1950s and 60s, you know, I-81 uh, was was just plowed through the 15th ward, a, a black community, uh, and now there's this giant, you know, sun blotting viaduct, um, and uh, you know, the, I mean, the the, the pollution is is uh, is extreme uh, from that freeway. You know, this I mean, Syracuse is the is one of the most uh, segregate, segregated and unequal cities in the country. Which is, you know, part of partly the legacy of that, that you know, concrete monolith that literally divided the city, right? And and now, you know, the city, the city, and the New York State Department of Transportation are, are in the planning phases um, oh. for removing that that yes. giant viaduct and for replacing it with kind of a street level 
boulevard that will have houses and yeah. businesses and you know other sort of desirable community elements and so uh yeah so you know just because we we made these horrific racist mistakes uh you know 70 years ago doesn't mean that we're stuck with them today you know we, we really can uh, redress some of those uh those errors and all of those were valuable reasons for including the book uh, including yes. that chapter yes in the book yeah. which made sense in that context and also i thought played the very important part of giving people something they can relate to directly and understand as yeah. humans and it's like my goodness it is an analogy for understanding all of these things and the the devastation that we're doing with these these roads and what could we do about that yeah um, yeah, 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 yeah it, right we've, we've all had that experience of you know of trying to you know, scamper across a, a busy highway. You know, we've all been stuck in traffic. Yes. <laughs> you know, we've, all, we've all been affected by this. Uh, you know, this 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 issue. I mean, I, yeah, it's one of the one of the interesting things that happened to me while working on this book was that I. So I, you know, I used to live in in Spokane, Washington, mm -hmm. and I wrote a big chunk of the book living in Spokane. And, and there, you know, we lived we lived on a, a busy arterial road that led to I ninety, um, and so we could hear you know both the arterial and the interstate. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I had I had really never thought about it before. And then I started reading some of the, the scientific literature about the, the health impacts of noise pollution. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in road noise, it, you know, it elevates our blood pressures and our cortisol levels and our heart rates. It makes us more susceptible to, you know, diabetes and stroke and cardiac disease and a million other problems. And I was like, holy cow, this, I mean, this, this, you know, living, <laughs> it's, it's literally killing us, you know, without us mm -hmm. really realizing it. So, you know, we're all, so when we moved to Colorado, you know, my wife and I prioritized finding a kind of a, a quiet, a quiet street uh, without, without road noise. And, and, uh, you know, I think we're a lot, a lot happier for it. Um, but yeah. you know, I, I think that's a kind of a classic issue is that we're, you know, again, we're, we're, we all live in kind of the thrall of roads. And as a result, we don't really, notice the ways in mm -hmm. which they, they're they're destroying our, our lives in a lot of respects mm -hmm. yeah i uh I, in the middle of watching shows commercials come on yeah. many of them lately are for suvs so <laughs> get out and go enjoy right. nature but guess what you got to drive this monster or they think you need to drive this big suv on a road to get to it so and and i remember you saying in your book and i've read it other places like cars have been great for Americans to get to nature, to have an appreciation, to maybe increase conservation. But wait a minute, we have these roads and we have the cars that have, mm -hmm. are letting off lead and zinc and whatever, you know, and yeah, so it's just such a weird contradiction. We, we need these cars to get out to enjoy nature, but we, these cars are also we needed roads and this is destroying nature to an extent <laughs> yeah it's a no it's a, it's a, a, a fundamental paradox and look I, you know i'm i'm part of the i'm part mm -hmm. of the problem right i you mm -hmm. know i live in colorado and we we live here in part because we want the outdoor access and you know and, and we we drive you know we drive our, our subaru like every other coloradan to you know <laughs> to uh to the you know to the to the trailheads into the to the mm -hmm. fishing the fishing holes and the ski mountains and so on right we're all out there you know driving around to experience nature even as it's our is spraying nature right exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, Subaru, yeah subaru actually has there's they have a, a new model called the wilderness the Subaru yeah. wilderness yeah. like holy yeah. cow it's you know you could not I mean, wilderness and cars are anathema, right? There's yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> two opposite things, and and yet, uh, so it is. You know, it is kind of this this tension or, or paradox. I mean, cars are inextricable from the history of conservation, right? Yeah. You know, you know, that was a, a big part of uh, you know when we when we created the national parks. You know, in the early 1900s, we you know we were you know one of the groups that really promoted them was the the American Automobile Association, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, because they wanted their members to have a place to go drive to. Uh, you know, and and now you know Yellowstone and Yosemite and all these other wonderful parks are places that you experience uh, from within your car uh, yeah. in, in many cases. And there's uh, you know there's a, a just a profound uh, irony there, I think. Yeah. Well, speaking of uh, roads, I mean, one of my favorite to drive on is Trail Ridge Road in Colorado in the Rocky Mountain National Parks. <laughs> it's fabulous, right? 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 That was you, yeah. you could bike it, but that's for the most diehard. <laughs> and that's not me. <laughs> right. but, but I would need to transport my bike to the road. Yeah. yeah so. But right. culturally, that seems to be sort of a, a cycle of inventing things, over exploiting, starting to realize 
because we can take advantage of things that we are taking advantage of things, maybe pulling back, rethinking, getting some experience about it. So we have, in a way, experienced wilderness, but in a very bizarre way, and then you wake up to it. Um, yeah. So yeah. how many miles I don't, I don't know. Maybe there drive? was Maybe there <laughs> was no other did... way to do it. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm just curious, how many miles did you drive? <laughs> to... Me personally working on this book? Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I should have I should have uh, accounted for that or, or at least, uh, you know, accounted for, uh, <laughs> you know, how many how many dead animals I, I saw. Yeah, well, well. No, it's, it's true. I mean, you know, I mean, this this fall, you know, I went on book tour. Right. And I, you know, drove I mean, I probably drove, you know, 15,000 <laughs> miles this fall promoting my book about the ills of driving. Right. Yeah. So, so we're all, <laughs> <laughs> we're all kind of trapped in this, uh, you know, this this yeah. automotive world together. And you know, I think, I mean, I think that's one of the things that I'm, I'm very conscious of in the book is, you know, trying to avoid shaming people for driving, right? Because we yeah. all do it. We all kind of have to do it. Uh, you know, we're all part of the problem. And you know, to me, you know, the answers to this this issue are, are really you know, their, their public policy or their infrastructural yeah. answers, right? We, you know, we, we if, if the goal is to sort of guilt Americans into driving less, that's just not going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, to me, the, the solution, are, you know, it's creating more walkable, bikeable, transit-oriented cities. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in those rural areas uh, where, you know, driving is, is kind of unavoidable uh, in many cases, you know, building those wildlife crossing yeah pieces of infrastructure that's uh, driving I, I wrote down a quotation from near the end of the book for just this purpose and i'd like i'd like to read it because i thought the idea oh, was please, yeah. like, yet making roads lie lighter on the land isn't the job of individual drivers right. any more than swapping out light bulbs will solve climate change instead it's a public works project one of history's most colossal like reforestation species reintroductions and the planting of oyster reefs is part of what the historian Thomas Berry described as humanity's great work, quote, moving the human project from its devastating exploitation to a benign presence. Yes. Yeah. It, yeah. it is. It's a collective great work. I yeah. think that's a lovely idea. Uh, yeah. Thanks, thanks for, Jeff. Yeah, thanks for including that. No, thanks for reading it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, um, I, well, I, I didn't mean that, you know, it's like. No, oh, no, I think it's it's true because he did just say that about the public. The yeah. Public yeah. yeah I mean, but that's, know, that's what we're embedded in. Yeah. And, you know, and, I, I think that, I think that, that, you know, to me, like that light bulb analogy always feels apt, right? Because, you know, for a long time, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, like, like the environment, the, the climate movement was very focused on, on, you know, on personal behavior, right? Change your yeah. life, you know, become a vegetarian. Yeah. Look, those are, those are all good things. But, you know, over time, the climate movement said, okay, first of all, that's not sufficient, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we're not going to save the planet by changing your light bulbs. And you know, if, if that's all we focus on, that turns a lot of people off. You know, we sound mm -hmm. like we kind of sound like scolds, you know, or, mm -hmm. or, or moralists, and that's that's not a great way to reach people. And so I think that over time, you know, the climate movement has said, okay, let's stop thinking about, you know, the sort of the individual individual behavior, and let's start you know, targeting the polluters and, you know, mm -hmm. sort of placing blame with the fossil fuel companies. And, you know, let's think also about, uh, you know, building out this giant renewable energy infrastructure, yeah. right? The solutions yeah. are public policy, they're political, they're, you know, they're infrastructural. And I think that, you know, that that this is kind of the same way, right? If, you know, if, if we can't, yeah. you know, heck, we can't hector people into driving less, you know, I, I right. really think that we just need to create a world in which, you know, the best choice is not always to get behind the wheel, right? But maybe the light bulb, which became symbolic, was the way to ratchet your way up to a bigger understanding of the of the great works that need to be done. Because you can't just start start there. It would seem, practically speaking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, understanding little things, and you know, uh, empathizing because we keep killing white-tailed deer, or understanding uh, what went on in black neighborhoods and the interstate development and things these all come together and lead to these bigger stories that you know is your theme yeah Ta -da. well so, you had yeah. a whole chapter and yeah. i was surprised it's more in the middle of the book but roads unmade yeah. and and so decommissioning some roads right. and the surprising fact that the u.s forest service operates a, yeah. the world's largest road network <laughs> and i didn't know that mm -hmm. yeah. and in fact i asked um so right in the beginning of the chapter you're in a car with a engineer and a hydrologist and an ecologist so yeah. you've got everybody <laughs> and so this is my place to say my oldest daughter is finishing her phd in hydrology yeah. her actual study is 
how does dirt from logging roads get into rivers which can smother the yeah. salmon? This is yeah. in Washington state. So of course these two, um, you know, uh, what do you call that? <laughs> I can't think of the word for the life of me, but these two products of the state are actually, you know, in competition, right? The dirt mm -hmm. from the roads smothering your fish. This right. is a problem. So, so this is what her PhD is on. That's and, <laughs> and, and I asked her after I read this chapter again, I said, Hey, um, do you use a national forest road? And she goes, no, we, we have an agreement with the private okay. road logging so that they can, you know, take their measurements that way. But, uh -huh. uh, but this was interesting. And so we're not going to convince people to stop driving, but how are we going to decommission roads? And we're talking these logging roads mostly, mm -hmm. right? Mining, logging. Yeah, ex exactly. You know, it's that, I mean, that, you know, that, that the, the fact that the fire service is, you know, the, the biggest road manager in the, in the world is always, yes. you know, blows people's minds. It certainly yeah. blew my mind when I first, when I first mm -hmm. learned that, you know, and I mean, you know, you could, you could go to the moon and most of the way back on forest service roads, which is just, uh, you know, kind of un unfathomable. And, and, uh, you know, again, as you, as you, as you said, Joanne, you know, that there, these are these old logging roads, you know, they're, they're, Fire, fire, firefighting roads, recreation roads, um, you know, out, out in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, many of them receive very little traffic, right? Nobody really, you know, not, I don't want to say nobody, but few people use them. Um, but they do still have these, you know, these, these big ecological impacts. And so, you know, oftentimes what that road decommissioning process looks like is, you know, basically taking heavy machinery, you know, the, the, the excavators, front loaders, you know, mm -hmm. the big yellow Tonka toys, you know, get, getting them up there and just ripping up that road bed. Because, you know, what happens in many cases is that, you know, those those logging roads, you know, if, you, if, if you've had, you know, 20 years of 30 ton logging trucks driving over you, right, the, the surface gets very compacted and it mm -hmm. becomes really hard for vegetation to take root. So even if you, you know, stop using that road, uh, it's it still doesn't, readily return to nature because you know the soil is, is so compacted so you really need to just take the, that heavy machinery rip up and loosen that soil do some replanting and and uh you know it's just amazing i mean working on this book i went to some you know some old decommissioned roads that had been you know destroyed in the the 1990s and you know you could go there today and, and have no idea that uh, a road had ever mm -hmm. been there yeah. uh, nature yeah. totally reclaimed it it's, it's pretty inspiring yeah, succession, <laughs> not yeah. the HBO show, <laughs> biological succession. That's right. <laughs> so, <Yeah. clears throat> wow. So, I mean, this whole book was so interesting. Um, I, I, I guess I just want clarification on one thing with the fish, the salmon, because I'm trying to imagine <clears throat> how are roads hurting salmon besides the runoff, like places for them to go uh, so I'm, I'm i was just still that was something conceptually i was having difficulties understanding um but okay. it seems to be having a big impact on salmon <clears throat> somehow I should, so. I, should have, I should have explained culverts better um, yeah. yeah so let's see so right so so imagine right i mean salmon as we all know right they're they're migrating upstream to spawn right and you know of course those streams that they're migrating in are often crossed by roads, you know, as we've been talking about roads and streams, you know, kind of often are, are uh, intersecting. Um, and every place where the stream goes under the road, you know, it, it gets passed through a culvert, right? And a culvert mm -hmm. is okay. it's a, you know, yeah. it's a little okay. pipe, right? It's, you know, mm -hmm. you know those, those metal corrugated, corrugated things, things yeah. right? Or concrete or what have you. And the problem is that often those culverts are, are really narrow because the people who built them were just thinking, okay, let's just, you know, get water through this thing. We don't mm -hmm. care about the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And so because the pipe is so narrow, it, it concentrates the force of the stream. It's like squeezing it like the tip of a hose or something. Mm -hmm. Right. And as a result, the fish can't swim against that fire hose. Uh, mm -hmm. They can't get up that culvert mm -hmm. across the road and, you know, go find their spawning habitat. So that's, you know, again, like it's, it's, it's kind of an invisible thing. You know, we all drive over yep. a million culverts every day, right? Without really noticing them. And and yet, you know, they're preventing all of these fish from, from reaching their habitat. And it's not just salmon, you know, it's, I mean, even in, in freshwater yep. systems, you know, it's trout and pike and, uh, you know, suckers and yeah. other, other species. So this, you know, it's, it's true that, you know, you don't really think about, 
you know, fish is being affected by roads. We don't hit them with our right. cars directly. Right. Exactly. Uh, so <laughs> preventing them from moving around the landscape, just as they're preventing mountain lions and bears and deer yeah. and other, other critters. And yet mitigating that is and many times not such a big deal. But then, I mean, of course it costs money, but still the, the answer is fairly simple and culverts are effective. Build, build and you have, That's it. This, <laughs> yeah, this is the book. <laughs> this is the book to read if people don't have culvert awareness. <laughs> yes. There are so many interesting things to know about culverts that we'll we'll leave for I, another time. I think. Yeah, yeah, my, 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 you know, my my previous book, my, my beaver book, also had a chapter about culverts. <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, beavers, you know, beavers are always damming up culverts in the sure. middle of the <laughs> yeah, yeah. You yeah. know what? I'm going to blame I, I my my <laughs> my ignorance is on living in central Illinois. <laughs> Of no, course, now that I think of these from. roads, I traveled from Seattle to Snoqualmie Falls and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Here's, what, here's, here's, yeah. here's what we'll do, jo Joanne. I, you know, I feel, I feel like, yeah, people people are sort of colored blind. So I'm, I'm going to I'll put up a, a Twitter poll or an X poll asking people if they know what a, what a culvert is. Yes. <laughs> I, I bet I bet it's going to be like 50 50. Probably. I, I think it depends where you live. So I think yeah. the word culvert will figure in the title of your next book. Oh, I, 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 I hope not. Okay. <laughs> oh, what, okay. Now, you asked a question on Twitter yesterday or the day before about some animals, famous animals living in national parks. Is that for oh, yeah. your next book or an article? That's for an article. Yeah, that's okay. that's an, uh, uh, yeah, an article about sort of, um, you know, charismatic uh, individual animals. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, still figuring out the next book, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I bet that I bet that it will. I bet that wildlife and infrastructure will again be part mm -hmm. of it. Okay, right. that's good news. Yes, yeah. it is. Very, it's very good. Very interesting. I'll, I'll, come back, I'll come back to be on the show in you know twenty twenty forty six when the book is excellent. <laughs> we we might still be here. We <laughs> well, our usual our usual end point is to say, what have we forgotten? What do you want to say before we finish? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I think I think that you were I think that you were, you were both incredibly thorough and uh, and comprehensive <laughs> in your in your, your questions. So I, I don't think we've forgotten anything. But uh, yeah, I just yeah, I want to thank thank you both again for the the incredibly thorough reading and the wonderful questions and and um, you know and thanks to everybody out there who's uh, read and engaged with this book in some way. It's, yeah. it's been a really fun uh, fun few months since it's come out to uh, you know hear reactions and to hear reader roadkill stories. I get yes. Lots, lots of those. <laughs> Yeah, you must get a lot of that. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 short, no shortage of roadkill pictures for sure. Yeah, oh, that's excellent. It's, <clears throat> it's because we love we love the book. We're excited well, about it. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. I look forward to whatever you produce next. So, uh, and in case somehow you've joined in late, that's okay. We are talking with Ben Goldfarb about his latest book, Crossings: How Road Ecology Is Shaping the Future of Our Planet. And I love this picture. You didn't get to choose that, I guess. I I didn't. No, I think I think that's a root in Switzerland. I think is what is the designer told me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I appreciate you did mention things about uh, England and the otter project. I love otters; they're my favorite. Um, but uh, you know, I'm like, oh, too bad they're dead. But you learn a lot just from yeah, collecting right. the roadkill. You know what? Yeah, it's going on with them. And then you went to Tasmania. So this book is not only U.S. centric, but no. We love our cars. We have a lot of roads, so yeah. it's understandably very U.S. heavy. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, no, you know, I think that, I mean, part of that was also COVID related too. You know, I mm -hmm. think my, my proposal had chapters set in Norway and Kenya and, and elsewhere. And then, you know, COVID happened. And that was, of yeah. course, the most kind of compelling inadvertent experiment in the history of road ecology, right? What happens when okay. you, you know, shut down... Uh, traffic for for a few months mm -hmm. uh, you know, and of course wildlife responded uh, spectacularly mm -hmm. um, yeah. but you know it also i think changed the scope of the book in some ways and, yeah. and uh, you know I, I, it was less you know maybe a little less international uh geographically than I, I intended but there are so many you know fascinating road stories uh here in the u.s that uh you know the world's most automotive country right that uh <laughs> and, and this has been some of them yeah. <laughs> yeah. yes this book was fabulous um Thank I'm you. glad Jeff also goes, wow, this is really interesting. So yeah. well, we made Jeff read, read some biology. That's good. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I learn something every time. Yeah, for sure. Even I do. I'm not a road ecologist. I'm yeah. a cell biologist, but you know, right. we, yeah, it's definitely widened my perspective. I appreciate it. So 
Yeah, Ben, keep up the good work. We'll have you back after your next book, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like good. you said, hopefully not 2046. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, sooner, than, sooner than that. Yes. Okay, Fantastic. wonderful. Thanks, Thank thanks you so definitely. much. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Ben. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I'll end the stream.